Leafs fam, hockey world, what is up? This is the Leafs Convo Podcast. My name is Norman James. Thank you for being with us for this Sunday spectacular of the podcast. We'll call it that for the time being until we come up with a better name. It's looking back on the week that was, looking forward to the weeks ahead. Our good friend Mike Agella will join us momentarily. He and I will discuss the rookie tournament in Laval. The Sands, Leafs, and Habs doing their thing. Toronto losing 6-5 to Ottawa in overtime. Not the greatest game ever, but a nice performance from one Jeremy Brackle. What, three apples looking fresh out there, giving us a glimpse of what will be in terms of Bracco and the Leafs going forward. He was also counteracting some of the lackluster performances from some of his teammates we'll discuss. Plus, when you hear a Western Conference general manager predicting what kind of money the Leafs are going to have to fork over to Austin Matthews and William Nylander, forget about it. Block that noise out because these guys have one thing in mind, driving up the amount of money the Leafs are going to pay to these cats so that the Leafs don't come after their players. Mike and I will get into that as well. He's ready to go. I'm ready to go. I know you're ready to go. The Leafs Convo Podcast Sunday Spectacular starts right now. And here he is, our good friend, the one and only Michael Paul Angelo. Hello, sir. How are you? Good morning, Norman. Uh, I'm fine, and uh, I actually uh, love the fact that last night when I went out for an, an evening meal, it was a little chilly in the air. Hopefully gone are the mm-hmm. sweltering, humid days of summer, and when there's a chill in the air, that means hockey is very close. You are correct, my friend. It is chilly here in London, Ontario, too. I'm basking in the coldness and i'm loving it six five the leafs rookies falling to the Sens rookies in laval i thought it was a pretty exciting game some hockey with some nhl branding on the the sweaters of the players hey mm-hmm. why not yeah I, my rule of thumb and as you know i've been coming i've been going to the rookie tournaments since i think 2010 that was my first one in london i didn't go this year because it was in laval and i'm going to be basically driving up and back to Toronto or Niagara Falls for training camp upcoming this Thursday. So I watched it like many of our listeners did on, on, uh, on the computer. Um, I, I don't obviously use the, the result of the game as my point of analysis. It's, it's the performance of the individuals. And I think there's a lot to be encouraged by with uh, the, some of the performances of the Maple Leafs players uh, yesterday. And I'll just put like off the top, because I know that I mentioned it on, on Twitter and then you retweeted what we had talked about on one of our previous combos. Uh, Jeremy Bracco is going to have a big year for the Toronto Marlies. And if he does have a big year, which I think, like I said, I think he will, <clears throat> he sets himself up for challenging for an NHL job in 2019. I, I really believe, you know, he's got a lot of skill, um, he didn't get a ton of playing time at the beginning of the year last year, but he was a point per game player at the end of the season for the Marlies. And then, you know, he only played a few games on their uh, run to the Calder Cup. But I think with the promotions that are going to happen, like Andreas Janssen and Kapanen being full time uh, and potentially others moving up, he's going to get a bigger role with the Marlies. And I think he had three assists yesterday and he is, his vision on ice is incredible. He's a good skater. He, tight turns he's you know i think he's got good hockey iq he all the things add up and you know with players costing a little more to bring a guy in on an entry level deal and somebody with a lot of skill that's going to be something that the leafs are going to be looking for and i think brocco is going to be an nhl or within a couple of years how would you compare brocco's game to marner's game because i've heard a lot of fans say the two have a lot of synergies a lot of similarities they're similar, um, but I think I actually think Marner is more of a shooter than than uh, than Brocco is. Brocco is a pure playmaker on the wing, and and I've said this since Brocco was drafted and then Matthews was drafted. I think Brocco is a perfect fit for Matthews uh, on the right side going forward. If he if the Leafs don't use him as part of a trade for something, uh, they played together on at the U.S. Uh, with for the U.S. at the under 18s years ago. And I just think his skill set matches, you know, Matthews in terms of him being, you know, Matthews being more of a shooting center and and Brocco being more of a playmaker. So I think he's more of a playmaker than Marner. But um, and some of the similar concerns, you know, he's smallish. He right now I think he needs to improve on his strength and his defensive game. Um, but 
I think there's enough differences where, you know, Marner is, I think Marner is in a league of his own in terms of Leaf wingers. He's at a certain level, and then I think Nylander and others fall behind. This is the Leafs combo, Norman James with Mike uh, Jello. If you want to win a Stanley Cup and you want to be a perennial contender, you have to make sure you have the chains moving, not only at the NHL level, but within the entire organization. Mm -hmm. So you have players who are going to contribute and help you get there uh, on your roster right now, but also players you expect to fill those roles down the line. Well, I think the luxury that the Leafs have right now, and you know, good organizations tend to have this luxury, is uh, they they don't have to look for a superstar among their prospects. They have their superstars. They have Tavares. They have Matthews. They have Marner. They have Nealander. Uh, they have a starting goaltender in uh, in Freddie Anderson. So they're looking for complementary pieces. They're looking for guys who can fill third, fourth line roles. Who can, you know, at least up front. That that I think that they're the chain of players that they have with the Marlies. And you know, I'll I'll mention off a few names: Trevor Moore, Mason Marchment, Adam Brooks, Brocko. Carl Grundstrom, all these guys within a couple years could be in the NHL, but they're not going to be expected to be first or second line guys. You know, some of them may plug in because they fit well with a Tavares or with a Matthews, but they don't, they don't need to fill those roles. Those roles are already full that what they, what, where the Leafs need somebody to step forward is on the blue line. And we saw a few examples yesterday. I mean, I thought Lilia Grin looked strong. Um, you know, he's, I saw some comments and I, I responded to them on, on Twitter about Lilligren skating, not being really strong last season in the AHL. And I observed, and I, I saw him for every game in the, uh, in the, in the playoffs, his skating improved, his strength improved in the playoffs later in the year. And I think there was a bit of tentativeness when it came to Lilligren early in the season, playing in the AHL as an 18 year old. Um, but you know, his strength and his skating ability and his overall skill, I think is something to look forward to, but it probably won't be on the Leafs this year. Um, but also, also Rasmus Sandin and uh, Sean Dersey, their top two picks from 2018 looked pretty good. So there is reason for optimism in terms of a couple of the players. And also I think a reason for pessimism on the part of somebody who I've liked and I hope rebounds, but Andrew Nielsen was probably the worst leaf on the ice yesterday he took a stupid elbowing penalty he took se i think seven penalty minutes um you know he's just he sometimes he had 143 penalty minutes last year with the marlies he, he's got to learn to control that if he wants to eventually make the nhl this is where we're at right now mike you're going to see the ascent of a young player begin and you're also going to see not necessarily the downward spiral of another player who's had high hopes but um you know some of these Younger players, they get mired uh, in a game that they are not able to elevate. Mike, no matter what we see from Timothy Liljegren or Rasmus Sandin or Sean Dersey, no matter how good they might look at training camp, the, the sixth defensive spot um, among the Maple Leafs defense corps is going to end up with one of the journeymen. Uh, I'm not saying Connor Carrick is a journeyman, but you know he's a bit of an afterthought, unfortunately. There's a... Obviously, uh, Jordan Subban's in there, Igor Arzaganov. Yeah. Justin Hole's another guy. But it, it, no matter how good these young players appear to be at this point, mm -hmm. Kyle Dubas is going to have to demonstrate some patience and some resistance in that regard, knowing that it's probably better to have somebody with less skill but a little bit more sage and a little bit more readiness than it is to, um, to elevate a young player with a lot of expectation who might not be ready yet, because I still think that six spot Mike, regardless of where it is on the depth chart is going to be an important, um, it's going to be an important spot to fill with it, with a player uh, who has, you know, important capabilities, even if they're not star studded. Well, I, and, and I will grant your point, and we've said it, uh, said it on previous shows. I mean, I, I, I at least, I, I think that what's going to end up happening um, like last year, they didn't really determine who that sixth defenseman was until January when they 
you know, when they solidified around Roman Polak after he had sort of shaken off the the after effects of the leg injury. But you know, they they played Kali Rosen, they played Borgman a lot, they played Carrick, they mixed and matched, they they rotated, as I've said before. And I think they're gonna do that the same. I think it's just gonna be different players. I mean, Ozaganov has waivers to go back down to the Marlies without being claimed. So I think they're gonna take advantage of that if he shows any kind of you know struggle with coming over to North America. But it's gonna be Carrick, it's gonna be Hall, it's gonna it could be Rosen because uh, waivers is not a consideration for him either, uh, or Borgman as well. So, I mean, I, I think that that's a possibility, and I still think there's a possibility if this team adds something on a PTO for training camp, it could be on defense because there are a few veterans out there that they might want to take a look at, and they're not they're not marrying themselves to them. So um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to see. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out, but – I mean, nobody knows how it's going to play out. It's all in the mind of Mike Babcock and Kyle Dubas. <laughs> they were pretty excited watching the game uh, in Laval yesterday. I like how that crew rolls together. That whole Maple Leafs management coaching posse kind of rolls together. I mean, they, they, the optics are that it's one big unit. Who knows personally whether they like each other or not. But um, this, this team's got a goal on the ice, in the boardroom, um, you know, in the coach's room. In, in the in the in the you know the, the offices of Forty Bay, this this whole crew has a goal, and that's to win a Stanley Cup. And I'm really, I'm really really excited about it, Michael. Um, this is the Leafs conversation. Norman James, along with Mike Ajella, thank you so much for all of your support. Nearing 1,400 subs on YouTube right now. Uh, we're on and off the top chart lists of uh, iTunes as well as Anchor. Um, all thanks to, to your support, your listenership, and um, you just keep it coming for us. We'll keep it coming for you. Anything else you wanted to add about the rookie tournament, Mike? I know the, the Leafs and the, the, the Baby Habs uh, have a game coming up. Um, the, the value of the rookie tournament, Mike, maybe you wanted to talk a little bit about how you like these, these teams coming together for their little uh, round robin. I definitely think you can learn something more, learn more about player, your own players, um, playing against competition and playing in scrimmages. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you a positive and a negative. The the positive was the skill that was shown at times on the Leafs power play that was used yesterday. Now it was mostly Marley, um, Mar Marley guys, but it was Brocco, Adam Brooks, uh, Grunstrom. Um, I know Nielsen was a point man on the power play. I think they used Lilligren once or twice. I mean, the the the, the skill of moving moving uh, the puck around. Um, I'm missing one guy, but I, you know, I'm just doing this on the fly. Um, but the skill that they showed was, was impressive. And I think, you know, that, you know, it's, it's, you can say it's against rookie competition, but they're essentially rookies. So it's, um, I think that that for, for the Marlies and maybe in the future, because I think at least two of those guys are going to be leaps in the future is, is a positive thing. Maybe more of them. Um, the negative, and this is not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to bury a, a young kid in his first, uh, in his first game, but I thought Ian Scott, the goaltender was, was out, was out to lunch at times. He was really bad. Um, you know, the, you saw that Ottawa after uh, after the Mar after the Leafs had taken a five four lead, I think with twenty eight seconds left to go, they came back and scored a goal eight seconds later, and then won on a breakaway uh, in an overtime. And you can't blame Scott for that, but I thought there were goals that he allowed that were savable. And it again, it's September. And he played, I think, one or maybe two games with the Marlies last year after playing in the WHL. I don't know where he's going to be in terms of the goaltending uh, depth of this organization down the line. He was a draft pick a few years ago, but I just didn't think he had an, an inspiring performance. Look, Melnick may have thrown him 50 bucks before the game and said, Ottawa needs any win it can get at any no. point. Come on, big boy. Um, the other thing, too, is, Mike, we don't know psychologically how these players are feeling pre-game, post-game, he could have just been in t incredibly nervous. This was a huge opportunity. Sure. And while, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm sure uh, the coach would have said, look, get out there, just do your thing. You let in some goals, big deal. You make some saves, that's more important to us. But these kids are excited. These kids are pumped up. And you probably know if you're this goaltender, you don't have a hope and hell of making the NHL. What we're expecting of you is to play well and to maybe fit into the uh, Marley's or the ECHL puzzle. And I don't know how a, a player who's already, you know, spent a little bit of time in the AHL 
um, might take that. And maybe there's a bit of a, um, a taking for granted of, um, you know, how the process is going to go. So we don't know the headspace. And so the, when you sure. wonder how the heck a player like that seems to be out to lunch or making bad plays, there are so many factors that could contribute um, to, to that activity. This is the Leafs Conversation, Norman James with Mike uh, Jello. Michael, I wanted to talk about your, your latest article, um, just sort of sizing up the reaction that, and, and these expectations and perhaps um, the, the fake news, if, if you will, that seems to be permeating out there regarding William Nylander uh, and you know, Austin Matthews and the kind of money that it is believed the Leafs will have to fork over to secure their services. Clearly, when the reaction is being put forth by adversarial individuals or uh, from other teams, especially from other conferences, you have to expect that what they're suggesting is not going to appease or satisfy or make fans of the Maple Leafs feel like everything will be able to get done and everything will be hunky-dory. Well, I mean, first with Nylander, and I'll go to Matthews and Marner after that. I mean, with Nylander, I mean, I understand, and, you know, Lee fans are starting to get a little worried. It's four days before training camp, and um, he hasn't been signed yet. I, I, I don't see a reason for concern because I don't think on either side there's, you know, the want for any kind of holdout, you know, maybe a day or two. But I think, you know, by the end of this week, he will be signed. It's just a question of, what he'll be signed to. And, you know, the, the point of view that's been out there is that, well, Nealanders had 60 point seasons, two years in a row. And, and the expectation of what he's going to make, I think is colored by the fact that it's in Toronto, that it's in a massive hockey media market that you have everybody speculating and that they're talking to their sources throughout the league. And when they, when they're talking to the sources throughout the league, they don't want to do the Leafs any favors. They don't want to say, well, the Leafs should be able to get him at this. No, they're saying, well, they should be able to you know, get him at $7 million. Well, I I don't think Kyle Dubas is going to sign William Nylander for an amount uh, that is, uh, I think, you know, over and above what most people think. You know, I, I did an analysis a couple months ago regarding Nylander and comparables to players that were, you know, similar in talent that were drafted around the same time that came up for contract in the last year. And we know that the cap has gone up, but you know the two guys that I, I've mentioned often were Nick Ehlers from the Winnipeg Jets and David Pasternak. And Pasternak signed last year for six point six six million. Uh, Ehlers signed a seven year deal for six million. Um, and I think that Nealander, if the Leafs give him fair value, and and Nealander is, is his expectations are realistic, gets like 6.25 to 6.5 on a six or seven year deal. I think that's reasonable. I think that's prudent on both sides. If Nylander's agents are looking for more than that, I don't think that it's going to be a holdout. I think it's just simply going to be, he's going to take the bridge deal like we've discussed. And and I don't think there's a lot of acrimony here. And we know that Nylander wants the long-term security. Well, to get the long-term security, you're going to have to maybe give up a little bit. And, and that, that's where, you know, I think there's a little bit of a, a battle going on, but I don't think it's something that's going to escalate to a, a long-term problem. But that's, you know, that th that's the way it's interpreted, and I, I just think it's sort of off base. Most knowledgeable fans have to believe that this is just all part and parcel of getting from one place to another uh, contractually, Mike. Uh, the garbage, the noise whether you choose to dive into it and immerse yourself into it and just perhaps enjoy it uh, is one thing, but it's all part of the process. Kyle Dubas has a job to do, right, Mike? He has a job to do, and um, that is to try to get William Nylander signed up. And, and for however long the process takes and however much garbage uh, is, 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 is put out there in the meantime, uh, so be it. You know, uh, The end result is what these guys are looking to accomplish. And that's why I think the Nealander contract is more important um, than <clears throat> anything right now because it sets the precedent for negotiations down the line. If agents smell that they can push around Kyle Dubas and get a little extra 
out of uh, out of him for William Nylander, then what's going to happen with uh, you know with with the 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 Matthew Matthews negotiations? What's going to happen with the Marner negotiations? It, it opens up the door to them getting pushed around in those situations. That's why I don't think it's going to happen. If 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 Nylander is looking for more than the Leafs think he uh, they, they you know that. He can, he deserves, I don't know if he deserves, he deserves whatever he can get, but more than they calculate he is worth, then I think they simply just go the bridge deal. And with, with Matthews, um, I saw that it was a comment from Darren Drager um, reporting a, a comment from a Western Conference general manager saying that, you know, he would bet a, basically bet a steak dinner if uh, um, Matthews didn't get at least a dollar over Connor McDavid. And I'm like, at the end of next year, if Austin Matthews scored 50 goals, then we'll talk about him making $12.5 million. And I'm, you know, I, I'm fully appreciative of how good Austin Matthews is. But first of all, Edmonton overpaid McDavid. And yeah, that's probably not a popular opinion. I, I think he I think they did. But you know, he made he's making he was making 15% of the cap when they signed him to 12 and a half million. And supposedly he left more money on the table. Well, there's the signal here. You have to leave a little bit of money on the table as Tavares did. And and, and if Matthews does that, I think he gets eight years. I think he'll get in the 11, 11 and a half million dollar range. But to say he's gonna get McDavid money. Unless he blows up and wins the Hart Trophy, as McDavid did in his second year, I, I, I again, I, I understand Drager reporting it, and it's and it's juicy and it's interesting, and it got a lot of Leaf fans, uh, you know, excited. But I, you know, I think it's a little bit of hyperbole. I think it's a little off base, and not not his reporting, but the the fact that somebody thinks that. Matthews will get twelve and a half million. I just don't think he will unless he blows up this year. Among most Leaf fans, Dreger's not the most respected guy considering his, his ties to Dave Notis, and he's kind of a, a bit of comic relief. And the Western Conference general manager, I could care less what this guy has to say. He's from the Western Conference. He's betting steak dinners. Come on, man. Well, we we, we, we bet tofu now, man. We, we bet vegan meals now man we don't bet steak dinners for goodness sakes the other thing too is they, they whoever the western conference general manager is any information he puts out there it's more of an antagonistic comment or suggestion well get i mean first of all get used to it because we're going to hear about this the next 12 months i mean until next september i, I you could see you could see matthews and marner's contracts lasting until just before training camp i mean I, I ideally i think the leafs want to get everything locked up and tidy as you were saying but you know that it doesn't work that way all the time, and you know, and you'll you'll probably hear stuff about offer sheets next summer, which is total bull. But you know, it's gonna it's it's gonna be out there because it's it is a possibility. But it yeah, I mean, essentially, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a Western Conference GM or an Eastern Conference GM. If it's a source around the league and it's not somebody from inside the Leaf organization, their viewpoint is let's get the Leafs to spend as much as possible because that's one less dollar we have to worry about them spending to get one of our players or somebody that we might want in free agency. That's what it is. They want them to, to be able to, to have to have as much money locked up on their good players as possible. Great way to finish off the podcast, Mike, before we let you go. Uh, what do you have planned for the next week? I mean, there's lots to come. We've got training camp. Um, we have uh, the start of preseason within a week. What, uh, what are you planning on doing? Well, personally, today I'll be watching the Buffalo Bills lose their home, their season opener. Um, but, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but, uh, Thursday is the opening of training camp up in Toronto. I'll be going up there to, to cover that. Uh, it'd be interesting to ask a few questions to Kyle Dubas. Although after his interview with Bob McKenzie, Bob asked him everything that I could even think of asking him. So maybe I'll have to think of some other things to ask him, but, uh, and then the on ice work at the Gale center arena, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Niagara falls, um, getting the first chance to see, you know, John Tavares in scrimmages. And then, you know, we'll talk about preseason games the following week. But it's going to be a busy week, a busy next weekend. And But for somebody who loves hockey and all of us who are anxious for the season, it's going to be something, you know, we anticipate and can't wait to hear and see. I, I'm so excited about the season ahead, Mike. Thanks, Norman.
That's going to wrap up this special edition of the Leafs Convo podcast. Thank you so much for being with us. We do what we do for you and ourselves and for you too. We're one big posse that's growing every single time Mike and I put another podcast on wax. You can reach out to us through social media at I am Sports Heart, at Mike and Buffalo, at the Leafs Combo. If you have anything else to say, you can do it through our YouTube channel, the comment section. Go ahead and make it happen. If you have a question for Mike for a future Mike's Mailbag, hashtag capital letters, ask Mike. We have a Patreon page that you can peruse and check out if you feel like throwing a couple dollars towards the podcast to help the overall health of this project. We'd appreciate Appreciate that very much. Plus, we're also looking for sponsorship all the time. You want to reach out to us, do it, and uh, maybe we can help each other out in the process. Wanted to extend a huge welcome to Dylan Morrow and Hunter Fallon Carruther. These guys are going to be contributing to the Leafs combo for the season ahead with all kinds of great content, commentary, and conversation. Just you wait. For Mike Ogello, I'm Norman James. Thanks for listening. The Leafs combo is out. Peace. <laughs>